if you haven't got those, take a copy of it. And then this is one of the other ones. Yeah. This is that survey we passed out. Yeah, I was going on Sunday, so I didn't. I saw on Facebook you fell. You have one of these. Look at tonight. Jared, how are you? All right. Okay, we're going to get started here tonight. Welcome. We appreciate y'all being here, coming out tonight. Sherry's just telling me Kevin's not doing so good. He still struggling because of the fall in his back, so please keep Kevin in your prayers, especially when we have prayer tonight. Uh, please mention Kevin, also the family at Connie Isis, as you know, uh, passed away this morning at six, about 6 o'clock, and so we rejoice with her, but yet mourn for her family. Also keep Vicki Cantrell, as we know, she's, she's struggling talked to her, to her brother, and um, he wasn't expecting a good outcome, but she's actually probably done better than they expected, which is good, and we hope that continues. And there's several others that will be on the prayer list. What I want to mention is, um, I found out Monday night was Glenn Brandstetter, and Glenn's last name is Brandstetter, isn't it, Jerry? He, uh, I was I told that he wasn't doing very good at all, and I don't don't know. He he's kind of a, an acquaintance that we made. And he's a cousin, isn't he? A cousin of Jerry, and he's down in the Bruner area. So please remember him in your prayers, and I know he'll appreciate that. I've had a chance to be able to sit and talk with him quite a bit, and so we hope that that leads to something good and things will work out for him. And there are others, of course, that we need to keep in our prayers as we think about what they're having to go through. And sometimes life's not always the easy road we want it to be, but it does uh, work out with our faith in the Lord, and that's what we rejoice in. So tonight we're going to pause for prayer and then dive into our study. But I need to ask a question. How many of you do not have a booklet and would like to have one to look at? You left it at home, we'll give you a, a, a loaner here, and then you can leave it in the pew, we'll pick them up. Anybody else need one? All right. Could I throw it like they do at Lambert's, the throw grows, would that work? Yeah. How many of you turned your heat on? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. A little chilly in the Ozarks now. But we hope it'll get better. About all, oh, let's see, summer starts again when? In June. Tonight we're going to continue our study in reference to learning how to study. Using the tools, and that's what we're talking about, tools for souls, and most of us are familiar with that. And just to reemphasize that we are thoroughly equipped. God has given us what we need. In other words, we have the scriptures. In fact, one of the things the study's been pointing out is that we have God's inspired word. Who directed the apostles into all things that God intended for us to have? Holy Spirit, that was the Spirit's work. And he was there to teach them all things and bring all things to remembrance. And so they were benefited by that direction of the Holy Spirit to the point that when they wrote, and those writers in the New Testament wrote, we have confidence in the Word of God. And do we need any other books besides the Word of God? You mean we don't need the Book of Mormon, as pointed out in our lesson last Wednesday night, Right? There's no need for it because we have all things that pertain to life and godliness. And that's about where we're going to start 
when we go to the to the videos. But before we do that, I want to want you to take your Bibles and turn to Acts 17. And if, as we're doing that in just a moment, we'll have a word of prayer. And Luther, is that microphone back there? The handheld. Okay, good. Leon, would you like to lead us in prayer? And please keep Kevin in, in, in mind in our prayers and those have been mentioned. Thank you. Let's pray. Our great and wondrous Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you with, with glad and sad hearts as we brought sister this week. Uh, be with her family and, and those, uh, those around her and those that look to her. Uh, be with uh, Kevin as he tries to re repair from, from his uh, fall. Be with all of us as we have those things that, that we need special help with. Be with those that take care of us. Help us learn in this session that we may better serve thee and I thy kingdom and, and to bring others to, to the gospel. Be with us forever. Forgive us of our many sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You take your car to, to a mechanic, what do you expect him to use if he has to do a repair on your car? Tools, right? So he's got a toolbox there. And if you go in there, mechanic, and he doesn't have any tools, you have to wonder about that mechanic. Now, Harry fixed a whole lot of stuff with duct tape and wire. Some of y'all remember Harry doing some of those repairs, and some of you probably used it a lot, but it gets to the point, you do need tools, and Harry had his tools. And, of course, the aim is to have the tools that enable us to teach the Scriptures. I'd like for you to look at chapter 17, verse 1. Luther, can you turn this overhead mic down just a little bit for me? This mic, can you turn it down? Maybe it won't echo so much. Can you all hear, still hear okay? Good. Now, when they had passed, verse 1, through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And as you know from reading the book of Acts, that when Paul went to a place with a synagogue, what was he going to do, first thing, when he started his process of evangelism? or teaching the gospel to the lost. What was he going to do? Going to go in the synagogue, because who would he find there? Jews. And they were good prospects because they had knowledge of what? God. They had, what else? Knowledge of the Messiah through the prophecies. And also, they believed that the Bible was what? That they had. The Old Testament was the inspired word of God. So that was important. And what would Paul do when he entered that synagogue? And Scripture says here in verse 2, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths, what did he do? Reasoned with them from the Scriptures. When we take a little booklet like this and we sit down with somebody, or in case you have the big one, the larger print, and Sherry, you want one of these? I actually have an extra larger print if you want it. Not saying you need it, you got good glasses, but I like the larger print. But when you sit down there and you open this book up and study with somebody, what are you doing? You're reasoning with them from... Scripture. So this is just a tool that allows us to reason from the Scriptures. And one of the interesting things about it is that it's focused, isn't it? Because we're not going to sit down and just read through the Old Testament and New Testament with a person. That would be great if we could, but they might die before we get done. And we don't want that to happen, especially if they're older. Of course, we all might die before we get done. But is it necessary to read Genesis through Revelation in order to teach somebody the gospel? No. So we can be focused, and that's what this is. This is a tool to help us focus upon the Scripture. Now, for a, someone that's doing this study, if you sit down with your family, friends, neighbors next door, 
Do you have to have all the scriptures memorized? No. Do you have to know everything in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation? No. Is it difficult for them to understand? Because we know, as Paul told us, whereby when you read, you can understand. Can people really read the scriptures and understand it? And a lot of people don't believe that. And some people are afraid of that. They feel, oh, wow, I don't know the scriptures well enough for them to read it and understand it. It doesn't require a, a vast amount of knowledge that maybe we think just the preacher or the elders or, or Brother Bob knows. All we've got to know is how to sit down, let them read, and fill in the blanks. Not hard, is it? So this is a simple, simple tool. And I don't know about you, but I like that simple tool. So we can reason from the scriptures. Yes, Charlotte? doesn't even have to know how to play it, does he? And caught up in the excitement of it. Yeah. Yeah, you're exactly right. It, it, you know, people are afraid to teach because they're afraid they don't have the full understanding of Scripture or they don't know everything or they're afraid they'll forget something. But, you know, when you look at this video... Rob's a pretty nice guy, isn't he? And he's sitting down with them, and he's being very kind and gentle with them, isn't he? And because of his love for the truth, he wants them to learn the truth. And so he presents that truth to them in love, of course, and reasons like Paul's reasoning. And, and, and interesting enough, too, how many Sabbaths did it take as Paul would reason? Three. Does that tell us that sometimes things take time? You know, these little booklets are short, and they're, they're not long at all, and there's three of them. And so you can sit down in one sitting and study with a person one, one week, people another week. And I think Rob said it took about an hour, was that right, hour and a half, to go through the entire booklet consistently. So you can do one an evening and do one a week in three weeks. What have you done? You've reasoned through the scripture, and what are they going to know? Well, we'll find out, but they're going to know the gospel. And they're also going to know, and one of the things he emphasizes, whether or not a person is saved or if they're lost. And so that's the beauty of that. So he reasoned here from the scriptures, from 3, and it's interesting, verse 3, that he was explaining and demonstrating what? That Christ had to suffer, rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the, he's the Christ. And that's, that's the focus. And if a person comes to understand and know that Jesus is the Christ, then they have a responsibility to Jesus, be obedient to the gospel. Can that change their lives? Yes, absolutely. Now notice in verse 3, I love these words here, explaining and demonstrating. How many school teachers? Got them all over here. And I say y'all. And what you end up doing. But anyway, despite that, a good teacher does what in teaching her students? Explains and what, Janet? Demonstrates. And the ESV translates explaining and proving. So Paul made a statement, then he goes back and he demonstrates and proves that what he's saying is true. Uh, verse 3 in the New American Standard translates the word that we see here in the New King James, demonstrating, giving evidence. Now what is interesting is when you think about Jesus in teaching, he would teach 
facts, but he'd also do what? He would demonstrate, wouldn't he? And how would he do it? The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. He creates word pictures. And what would Paul have at his disposal to explain and demonstrate that Christ had to suffer and rise again the third day? The Old Testament. And he could go and look at the prophecies and then he could refer to something that happened in Jerusalem that was like headlines all over the world. And exactly right. He could explain what Christ did. That he was in the grave just like he was prophesied. He was born in Bethlehem. He used those prophecies. And, and he would bring to them the knowledge of that man that they crucified on the cross through the prophecies and show how that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah and prove that he was of the lineage of David and we could go on and on but he would be able to do that and he could get their attention explain to them so that they would have the understanding that was necessary for them to know that Jesus that he preached was the Messiah, the Christ and here's what happens when we do that and I love this verse, too, because it says, and how many were persuaded? Doesn't it read, all of them were persuaded? No, it doesn't read that. Some of them were persuaded. Now, when you sit down and teach somebody even from this book, as simple as it is, will everybody obey the gospel after you get done? Won't happen, will it, Terry? But some will. In fact, the percentage is pretty high according to the research done by um, Rob Whitaker in using this. It's been around for a long time. It's nothing new. You might have seen them before. It was written by Bobby Bates, who's dead. But it's a simple way that focuses on the necessary elements to be able to teach somebody. And some will be persuaded. We need to remember that, don't we? Because oftentimes you will hear... Well, nobody wants to obey the gospel now in America because look at the mess we're in, right? Is that true? What have we proven over the last few years and years before that? What's the church here through the years proven? Fields are wide. There are people who will obey the gospel. And so it's, study does work. And in fact, we read that some of them persuaded, then he... Of the scripture Luke writes and gives us somewhat of a count. So what was the numbers that obeyed? Some of them were persuaded and a great multitude of devout Greeks. And who would these Greeks be, Daniel? He's in the synagogue. Who would, who would the Greeks be? Potentially proselytes, those converted to Judaism. Um, and not a few of them, what? Leading women. That's, there were women who obeyed the gospel. And they joined Paul and Silas. So the work was effective because they were able to persuade. With that in mind, we're going to take and go then, if there's any questions. Anybody have any questions, thoughts? We're going to go into the video for the rest of our time. We should be able to finish it, actually, uh, the rest of it. We're going to pick up uh, where we left off, and it'll be about 2 Peter on page 5. I think we, we got down to 2 Peter. Through that. We're going to start there and then go on to the rest of the booklet uh, for this session. Any questions, comments, anything anybody wants to say before we get going? All right, Luther, if you wouldn't give that a whirl and see if we can get that to work. Thank you so much. We really appreciate Luther and Jason, the work they've been doing, as well as Seth. We've got a second Peter. And a second Peter 1, 3. And uh, here is, uh, here's what this uh, verse says. Um, whose, whose turn is it? I've lost my place. All right. uh, Nicole, go ahead. According as his divine power has given us 
unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Okay, and let's look at the, the question. Has God given us all things that pertain to life and godliness? That's what it says. He's given us all things. And again, that, that goes back to our, our map, doesn't it? Remember we started with all the truth? And now we're moving it down. So now we've got all things given. So let's go to our second part of the question. Since God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness in the Bible, should we use any other source or should any other source be used as our religious authority? Should we go to some other source since he's given us everything? No. Absolutely not. So uh, this next section is just going to build on that. We must not add or take away from God's word. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. Now, we're going to go to the Old Testament. Now, your Bible, remember when I did that exercise and I kind of opened it up in the middle? You were in the Old Testament. The Old Testament starts with the book of Genesis. I'm sure you guys, you know, you've heard of the book of Genesis. So if you go to Genesis, that's your first book of the Old Testament. Your second book is Exodus, then Leviticus, then Numbers, then Deuteronomy. They're big books. We're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. Ken, you're quicker than I am. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. I mean, it's wonderful. And Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2. All right. And um, as soon as we all get there, I'll read that. And these books are written by Moses. There's five of them. And um, this is a principle that is given in both Old and New Testament. So we're going to go to the Old Testament to start, and then we'll go back to the New. All right? Deuteronomy 4, 2 says, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. All right, question. Would we please God if we added to or deleted anything from his word? Would that please God? Not according to Moses. Not according to Moses. And, um, and in fact, we're going to see that that, that principle is repeated throughout the Bible, that we're not to add or take away from his word. All right. Let's go to Galatians 1. Now, Galatians in your New Testament, so if you go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you had Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians. So see if you can kind of walk yourself through that. If you find Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you just walk yourself through that. And you'll find Galatians in there. Okay, where are you at here? Keep going, keep going back. You're almost there. Right one page before Ephesians, you'll find it. There you go. I'll be glad when I get to the day that I can actually just say all that in order like you just did. <laughs> it will happen, I promise you. After three studies of these lessons, that it will happen. You'll know them. I have trouble well. finding it when I'm looking at it on Google, so obviously I'm, I'm still working at it. <laughs> Galatians 1, 6 through 9. And when everybody gets there, uh, Ken, I'll have you read, uh, read those verses for us. Um, let's see here. I marvel that you are turning away to so soon from him who called you in, in, the, in the grace of Christ uh, to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Okay. Um, and there's a long set of verses, and it kind of looks like it repeats itself at the end, and it really does. I mean, it's for emphasis. He says it twice. So here's our question. Will we be accursed if we add to or take anything from the Bible? Absolutely. Yes, and, he, and notice this. He says, even if an angel from heaven says something different from what they've received, let him be accursed. That's a pretty strong statement. And, and he's emphasizing the fact that... Uh, he wants us to listen to, to God's word. So, um, you guys have any questions so far? Everything? No, just, that makes sense. All right, very good. Um, the next text comes from the Old Testament again, and we're going to go to Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. It's your third book of the Bible. So, Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus. All right, in Leviticus chapter 10. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2, all right? And uh, Marissa, are you ready to read that? Okay, go right ahead. 
Aaron's son, uh, Nadab. Nadab. Mm -hmm. and, and Abihu. <laughs> Weird names. <laughs> we don't use those names today. I don't. You probably don't know a Nadab or a Abihu, do you? I don't think I do. <laughs> All right. Uh, took their um, censer. Censers. Okay. And put uh, put fire in them and added incense. Incense. Mm -hmm. And they off and they offered an authorized fire before the Lord, contrary to His command. Okay. Verse two. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. All right. So Nadab and Abihu are the sons of Aaron. Aaron was the high priest. So these are the high priest's sons. If there were any two men on the face of the earth at that time who knew how to properly worship God, it was Nadab and Abihu. A censer was a device they used for collecting the fire, and they would offer a sacrifice for God, a burnt sacrifice. Well, they put the incense, in this particular case, on it, and they offered this strange fire or profane fire. I think your version... Marissa said, unauthorized, is that what it said? Unauthorized fire? You know what that means? God had never instructed them to do that. He did not tell them to worship him like that. Notice that. And uh, he had not commanded. Then fire comes out, and they're devoured. This is a pretty serious case here. So let's look at our question. There's several questions here. First, these men offered strange fire before the Lord, which he what? Which he had what? He's not authorized. He authorized. He's not commanded them. He never told them to do this. So he had not commanded or he had not authorized. All right? Let's look at our next question. Did they alter God's commandment? In other words, did they do something? Yes. Yeah. Do something they weren't commanded? Yes. They altered them. And kind of they added something to it. And we, of course, read that we're not to add. Was God pleased with them when they did this? Did that, did that make God happy? No. <laughs> Apparently not. Uh, apparently not. Fire comes out, so that's not good. Must we be careful how we handle the Word of God? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's precious. It's His Word, so we, we've got to be careful that we handle it correctly. Let's go to page 6, and um, we're going to see Second John 9. Now, that's those little bitty letters right near Revelation, Second John 9. So let's go near Revelation to Second John 9. All right, Second John 9. And there's a first John, a second John, and a third John. So we want the second one. And, uh, and it's just uh, 13 verses. So not even a chapter there for us. Keep going to the end. Yeah. Okay. Go towards Revelation, Ken. It's those little bitty books. Little bitty books. All right. There, there we, we go. go. Second John and 9. And Nicole, would you read that for us? Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Okay. Question for Ken and Marissa. If we do not abide in the doctrine of Christ, is God pleased? Doctrine just means teaching, right? That's exactly right. We don't That's abide in the teaching. Bible. Okay, very good. And like I said, you know, one of the things that you're going to find out in, in different versions of the Bible, maybe a different word is used, and, and yours says teaching, and that, that's, that's a good translation. And so the question is, if we do not abide in the doctrine or teaching of Christ, is God pleased? No, he's not pleased. If we don't abide in what he says, he's not pleased. Now, this is a personal question, Ken and Marissa. And it said, do you want to please God? Well, obviously, we, do. Yeah. we wouldn't be doing the study. So obviously we do. All right, so um, let's go to Matthew 15 and 9. Matthew 15 and 9. Matthew, of course, your first book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So, once you find one of them, you probably can find the other one. Matthew chapter 15, verse 9. There you go, Ken. All right. And, um, all right. And uh, who's next here? I think probably already remember the truth shot. All right, Nicole, go ahead. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So their worship to God was unacceptable. The Bible says vain or empty. Because they taught what? For doctrines the... The commandments of men instead of the commandments of, of God. Yeah, exactly right. They were teaching their traditions, their commandments of men. 
And so that's why their worship to God was unacceptable. They taught the doctrines, commandments of men. Now we have one more question, then we move to our last section of the booklet. Matthew 7, 21. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. So we're going to go back to chapter 7 of Matthew. And uh, this is actually spoken in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it starts in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And we're going to look at verse 21. And I'll go ahead and read that when you get there. You're, sorry. No, no, no. You're in Matthew, Ken. Matthew. I'm flipping all over the place. I'm sorry. That's okay. Go to chapter go, 7. Oh, 7. Go we're, ahead. I'm with you. We are uh, not on a timetable here. So. so look at verse 21. All right. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Two questions. First, who will be allowed to enter heaven? Those who what? Follow the word. Do, do the will of the Father, right? You've got to do the will of the Father. Now, Marissa and Ken, once again, this is a personal question, but it emphasizes the importance of the study. Do you want to go to heaven? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why we've got to do the will of the Father. Our last section in this book is going to be titled, We Are Under Which Law? All right. So I'm going to move this down to the last section here. So now we have the Bible. Remember I've spoken a couple of times about the Old and New Testament? Here are a couple of things I want you to think about. The Bible is composed of two covenants, two testaments, two wills. And most Bibles have a white piece of paper in between them. One separating the Old and New Testament. Matthew starts the New Testament. All right, Malachi ends the Old Testament. So in between Malachi and Matthew, there's kind of a blank piece of paper because everybody realizes there are two testaments. The Old Testament has 39 books. The New Testament has 27 books. Here are a couple questions just to consider. Are we under both laws today, the Old and New? Are we under just one of the laws? And if we are, which one? Are we under the Old Testament or the New Testament? And let, you, let me give you another question. And this is one I'm going to ask you again when we're finished. Are we under the Ten Commandments today? Have you ever seen the signs people put them in their yards? Ten Commandment signs? I mean, I, I love to see people that, that respect the Bible. But are we under the Ten Commandments? So don't answer, but just think about it. All right? Let's go to our verse, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. A scripture we've already read it's towards Revelation, again, it's kind of a big book, Hebrews, right before the Johns and Peters, at the end of your Bible. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. All right, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. All right? And um, we got that, everybody there? All right? So when we get there, Ken, if you'll read that for us. Um, again, we've already read it, but it's going to help, help teach us a principle here. Go ahead. Um, God who at various times and in various ways spoke, spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets uh, has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things. Through him also he made the world. Okay, so let's look at this, uh, a different teaching of this verse. God formerly gave his revelations to the fathers by the prophets. So how did God at one time communicate all this truth to us? One time he did it through prophets. But here's the significant part. Look at verse 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us through his what? How does he speak today? He speaks through his what, Marissa? Um, by a son. By a son, right. So he used to speak through prophets, but now he speaks through his son. And so, but today he speaks through his son, all right? So we've established that, and this is going to help us understand what law we're under. Okay, Matthew 28, 18, we're going to go to back to the New Testament, and we're going to look at the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew 28, last chapter. I think we've read this verse uh, already. For emphasis, we want to, we want to um, look at it one more time. Matthew 28, you got there, Ken? Good, good. Matthew 28, 18. And uh, Marissa, when you get there, if yeah, you'll read that verse for us. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Okay, 
So how much authority did God give Jesus again? All of it. All of it. We've learned that already. So we know God speaks through Jesus today. We know he's got all authority today. And another verse is John 12, 48. So Nicole, if you'll get John 12, 48, let's turn our Bibles there. And we'll again, we're in Matthew. So we'll go Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 12, verse 48. All right. Well, when you say he speaks to us today, you mean through the Bible, is that right? Exactly right. Yeah, God speaks to us today I've, through... I've just heard that he hasn't spoken to us recently is the reason I'm saying right. that question. Absolutely. I'm sorry for interrupting. But no, no, you guys, anytime you have a comment or a question, all you got to do is just ask it. And that's what we're here for, okay? So, sure, Matthew 28 and verse 18, now we're in John 12 and 48. All right, Nicole, John 12, 48. Oh, hang on just a second. No, no, I'm sorry, guys. It's okay. I no, asked some questions and forgot. When you get it, you have a question, we want you to ask it. You don't have to. All right, go ahead. He that rejecteth me and hath and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. All right, question uh, for Ken and Marissa. We will be judged by the words of who? Whose words? Jesus, Jesus and the Father. Jesus, right? He got it from the Father. So Jesus, the words of Jesus, right? So he's going to judge us. Now those are three verses we've already covered, but they're really going to help us understand what law we're living under. Now, you're in John. Go to the first chapter. First chapter, same book. Go to chapter one. And we're going to start uncovering something very interesting about the law. And here's what it says, verse 17. For the law was given by Moses, but... Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So here's the question. The law was given by who? Who gave the law? The verse says Moses, right? And Marissa, grace and truth came by who? Jesus Christ. So the law, notice the separation. Kind of like the mountain here we have, a little separation. You have the law, the Old Testament, Moses. Grace and truth, New Testament, Jesus Christ. There's a, there's a split here. Now let's go to Hebrews 9. 15 through 17. Y'all remember Hebrews? They're back towards Revelation. You have the book of Hebrews, all right? So Hebrews 9, 15 through 17. Hebrews 9, 15 through 17. If you guys don't mind, I'm going to read this passage. I'm not skipping you, Ken, but I'm going to, I'm going to kind of explain this passage as we walk through it. There's some illustrations we're going to use here. Um, these, these verses are very, very informative. They're really going to help clarify our, our lesson. All right. Hebrews 9, 15 through 17. And for this cause he, now the he here is Jesus, is the mediator of the New Testament. Now a mediator is a go-between. Um, a mediator brings two sides together, represents equally, impartially. So Jesus being God and man represents God and us. He's a mediator. He stands in between. So for this cause, he, that is Jesus, is the mediator of the New Testament. He mediates for the New Testament. Now some versions say covenant. It's all right. Does yours say covenant? Mine says covenant. Okay. Or even will. A will, a covenant, testament, law. We're talking about the same thing. That by means of death, okay, there had to be death. Why was there death? For the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. So there was a, a death. Jesus died. Why did he die? To redeem people from the first testament, the Old Testament. So Jesus died so that his blood would go back and would flow to help all those under the Old Testament. Notice what it says. That they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So Jesus died for all those who live before the cross. Picture in your mind if you would a cross. The cross goes backwards, it goes forward. Jesus died for everyone before his death. Go to verse 16. For where a testament is, or a covenant, or a will, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Do you guys, have you guys ever put together a last will and testament? Have you ever, do you have a will? Okay, we, we have a will. My, my wife and I have a will, and it, it wills of our, our, our material possessions and our authority for our children to certain people to care for them just in case something happens to us. It's a will. 
Think about it in this light. All right? Let's suppose, Ken, you, you decided that you really like us. Robin, because you, you really love us. You know what? I'm going to go home and change my will, and I'm going to give everything I've got to them. You come and say, Rob, Nicole, we, we, we have this relationship. I'm going to will it all to you guys. I said, well, that's awful nice, Ken. And uh, Marissa, she's not going to do that. Just Ken is. So. All right. So I come up to the door the next day, and I say, Ken, um, I'm ready to collect. I want your Corvette. I want your house. I'm here. You're, I'm in the will. I'm ready for it all right now. Well, you would look at me like I'd lost my mind. Why? Because you're still living. I'm still here. All right? You're still here. And it doesn't matter if I go to a judge or an attorney or whoever. The will has no power until you die. Think about the old will and the new will. It's a will. Jesus authored a new will. And so the questions now are going to be very simple. Is Jesus the mediator of the New Testament? Well, verse 15, what does it say? He is the mediator of the New Testament. So what's the answer? Is he the mediator? Yes. Yes. Now, when did the New Testament of Jesus go into effect? When did this will go into effect? When he died on the cross. When he died. That's exactly right. Very simple. Just like your will goes into effect when you die, my will goes into effect when I die. And so when Jesus died, his will went into effect. That's right. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 8. We're in the same book, just one chapter. And Ken, would you read verses 6 and 7? Hebrews 8, 6 and 7. Uh, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Okay. Uh, and you said 7 as well. Yes, uh, for, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Okay, great. Let's look at our first question. Is Jesus the mediator of a better covenant? Mm, yeah. That's what it says, isn't it? Absolutely. Okay. Now, look at this next question, Ken and Marissa, and think about this. If the first covenant, the Old Testament, had been faultless, would God have given us the second one? Would he have given us another one if the first one had been faultless? Um, my answer is probably wrong, but I'd say yes because the first one pretells or pretells of Jesus coming. Well, you're right about that. But notice what it says here in the verse. It says that uh, for the first covenant, for if the first covenant had been faultless, that means perfect. Which it wasn't. Which it wasn't, right. right. So that's why there's a second. Exactly right. Now, sometimes about this point in the study, someone asks, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce the question. Well, isn't Jesus and God perfect? Why did they give us a faulty covenant? Were you thinking that? No, I was just thinking that. Okay. We get that question a lot. The answer, do you know the answers in verse 8 to that question? Look at verse 8. We won't read that, Marissa. Read verse 8. But God found fault with the people and said. Okay, stop right there. God found fault with the what? The people. So what was the problem, the people? The people could not keep the law. The people needed the sacrifice of Christ. The people were imperfect, so they needed it. And so what we find is that... Uh, the fault was not that God gave us a faulty law. It is that the people could not keep it. And so the question again, is Jesus the mediator of a better covenant? And you said it, yes. If that first covenant had been faultless, would God have given us the second covenant? No, that's right. Let's go to the last verse of this chapter. Look at chapter 8, verse 13. And Ken, would you read that for us, please? In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first uh, obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Okay, so Ken and Marissa, when God gave the new covenant, did he make the first one old no longer in force? Well, yeah. Yep, Marissa? Yeah. No, then why do we keep it? Well, that's a good question, a question we will answer almost at the end of this study. So, so if you'll just hold... thinking we'd get through it, but I started a little uh, a section back, but it was a good review, so I, I left it there. But I know where we're at, because my wife's going to remind me. And y'all can too. 34, right? Page, or question 34. Why is it important that people understand what covenant we're under? This is a quick question. Yes. Yeah. 
because they get them mixed up and they, they do things that under the Old, Old Testament. They'll pick and choose things to do under the Old Testament uh, from incense to other different things, even keeping the Sabbath. There's folks that, that are claiming to follow Christ, but they keep the Sabbath. And Paul would argue that if you keep one part of the law, you're bound to do what? Keep it all. How many folks today want to do animal sacrifices? What do most people go? Yuck. And that creates the problem. So it's important that people do understand it. Well, one quick question while we're still getting ready here and then we'll, we'll move on. I've had nobody ask me about this. And we're coming up on what time of year? You know, we've got through Halloween. That's right. And they kind of skip Thanksgiving, but you know how that goes. But how many people, if you hung this on their door, would not want to investigate? Because what's it look like? Hey, somebody gave me a gift card. Well, they did get a gift card. And it's a gift that shows access to over 1,500 videos that are tools to teach what? You already know. Teach the scriptures. And so we will be making these available if you'd like to give somebody a gift. And what's really neat about it, on the back you can stamp or write in there, uh, Marshall Church of Christ, or you can put your name on it. So you literally can give this as a gift to people. And there's not very many of us that can't give this to our neighbor, is there? Or friend. Now, if I get arrested handing them out at Walmart, y'all know why. But but it is it's something you can can pass out, and and it gets their attention this time of year. So we're coming up on that time of year. So we'll make sure that we got these, so you can hand those out. How many have been curious about that? Good. All right. Get everybody in here. Seth, how are you doing? Looks like you're eating something. Here it is. I'm jealous. Hey, Haley, you're doing announcements, right? Uh, do you have Dean on, on your list? Okay, good. I forgot to mention Dean. And
Good evening. Glad that everybody was able to come out this evening and Bible study. We're about to enter into a devotional period. I want to thank our uh, visitor. Roy says I need to bring it up. Uh, where did I leave off? Start over? Anyway, uh, just want to uh, thank our visitor friends for being with us this evening and want to thank uh, all their children uh, joining our classes and making them merry. Appreciate that. Um, got several announcements, so I'll get right, right with it. Uh, do want to kind of go back over again. I, Connie Ison's passed away this morning. As of right now, we don't know of any arrangements, so please stay tuned and uh, be alert for those those announcements as they come along. Uh, Vicki Cantrell is, is gaining a little bit and, and may try to take her off then later tomorrow. Uh, we'll just pray for that and see how that goes for her. Um, I also would like to mention Steve Burnham uh, having a pretty serious fall and, and is still uh, working through that, trying trying to get better. Uh, Dean Bowman is is getting a little better uh, and uh, so con continues to covet our prayers. Uh, I'd like to mention uh, Kelsey Gray. This is June Boone's granddaughter and she has come down with COVID and she's eight months pregnant. So be with, uh, be with her in prayer and, and uh, this is Kelsey Gray, okay? And uh, I'd like to mention Michelle Ipoch. Uh, we'll be starting chemo this Friday and it sounds like it's gonna be a long-term uh, thing that uh, may uh, may be just the um, rest, rest of her life as, as uh, um, those things go. Clayton had a little minor surgery on his face and uh, everything is, is okay and good and uh, just when you, I'm sure as we have all seen the patch, uh, that's what's happened. So nothing, nothing more to worry about at this particular time. Everything is already taken care of. Um, I'd like to read a card from the Brandstetters. This is Marshfield Church of Christ. Thank you so much for the contribution to the Fair Havens Children's Home in the memory of Johnny Branstead and Christian Love, Jerry and Carly. Uh, as far as uh, his activities coming up, we have uh, wood cutting this Saturday starting at 9 o'clock. Uh, be at Jim Cruz's farm. If you don't know how to get there, you can call Jim or this guy here. He'll, he'll be able to direct you right on in. And uh, remember the time change. We fall back. We can get to sleep an extra hour. So we won't be going to sleep in the sermon, right? <laughs> Uh, and also, a uh, couple of good things. Uh, we got a potluck this coming Sunday. And uh, just look forward to those for the fellowship. I, uh, I really appreciate uh, the cooking that, that's there as well. The ladies do a very good job. Got one other item here that's a great joy. Connie Going, you may have met her or seen her sitting with Terry up over here on Sunday morning. 
She was baptized this afternoon. So that, that, that would be that would be a great great thing, and look forward to seeing her actually in person before before too long. I got a little scripture that I'd like to read. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I was uh, trying to get through real quick here. Okay. I seen him looking at his watch. That means hurry. <laughs> uh, it says, but now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. And all we are is the work of your hand. Let us pray. Father, and come before you now, I'd like to raise up the, the names that we've talked about this evening and the families of those that uh, are suffering loss. And pray that you'd be with, uh, be with us if we go through this uh, devotional period. In Christ's name, amen. I'm sorry, there's one other uh, I got for um, Jerry Letterman as a uh, jail ministry page that'll be laid in the back and uh, also looking for signatures on that and then also I forgot to mention that uh, Tim uh, the coordinator this month is if you're not able to serve uh, in your capacity as listed on the the, uh, for the, the men duty sheet uh, contact him a song before the lesson number 496 496 <clears throat> we'll sing the first and last <clears throat> oh, listen to the wondrous story God is once among the lost Yet one come down from heaven's glory Saving us at awful cost Who saved us from eternal loss What did he do? Where is he? <coughs> in heaven interceding, will you come to serve the Savior to his suffer humbly bow? You too can come to know his favor. He will save you, save you now. Who saved us from eternal loss? What did he do? Where is he now? In heaven interceding. 316 would be our invitation song. 316. Good evening. Um, I had a few things I wanted to share with you this evening. Actually, one is just a little bit longer than, I hope it's not longer than it should be, shorter than I usually do. But 1 Peter 5 8 is, well, actually, uh, I'm going to do a little more than that. It'll be probably start in. First Peter 5, 5. We'll start there, but not yet. I want to talk a little bit this evening about temptation, the vulnerability of people, both young and old, and how we, how we do that, and, and why we're vulnerable. Several things come to mind. One is ignorance, and... Uh, some people think if they're called ignorant that you're really putting them down. Well, 
I heard a fellow say, talking about attitudes and positive attitudes, and he said, I have a really positive attitude, but he said, I'm ignorant enough, you don't want me doing surgery on you. So ignorance can be cured, but sometimes that makes us vulnerable. Bad habits make us vulnerable. Stubbornness makes us vulnerable. And lack of self-control makes us vulnerable. And, and we could just list a whole lot of things. Um, and these things can lead to life-changing events that we, we just can't change them. That's, that's the way it is. And that may or may not be reversible. Now, picture this for a moment. It could be in America, but this particular setting is Nigeria. And you're wanting to better yourself. I know that Nigeria is what we call a developing country. And uh, some of it's developed, some of it isn't. But just like here, there are people who want to make themselves better. So whether they get online or whether they they uh, are recruited locally somehow or another, uh, this person decides, I I'd like to be a nurse. I'd like to work in the, in the health field. Well, this person that they're talking to tells them, I, I can help you do that. And so they recruit them and they say, uh, well, it won't be in this country not going to be here in Nigeria it's it's going to be in Denmark we're going to go to Denmark and you can fulfill your dreams and live out your dreams right there well, this sounds great I'm going to go to Denmark so then they travel to Denmark and upon arrival they learn that the job they thought that they thought they were going to have isn't isn't to be at all they've been recruited and now they are a slave and they've entered um, a trade that although it's popular in denmark it's popular here in places uh, we've got children present so i'm not going to mention all of it but uh, just picture las vegas and you know what that trade is but they have now they're, they can't go anywhere. They can't do anything. They're, they're far, far from home. And they can't go back. But it's not just them. There are other people from Nigeria. There are other African countries represented. There are Asian countries represented. And, and these people can't go anywhere. And no way out, no way to go home. And all of them are there. They were vulnerable, and, and how did they get there? So what does that have to do with us? Well, when we look at 1 Peter 5, 5 through 8, or 5 through uh, 11, we read, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, and but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. The one verse I want us to focus on there is the fact that the devil walks about in all types of forms, seeking whom he may devour and tempt. So I, I thought about this, and, and I think about our phones, the internet, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and I'm sure there's lots of others that I don't even know about. They can all be really good tools in the right hands. 
And we use some of those as good tools. But they can be a temptation, not just to adults, but children as well, to sin in various and different ways. Plus, if someone's vulnerable enough, then it can be a danger there. Uh, we, we've all heard those stories about various ones that have succumbed to it. Um, but each of us has a, has a responsibility to keep ourselves in subjection to God's will, but those of us who are parents or grandparents, but especially parents, have a duty to supervise and help the children to learn self-discipline with these devices. And sometimes that's not easy. Uh, I know because I've, I've seen it in my own house. I even saw it this afternoon when one of the grandchildren was there. Uh, the one reason I knew about it was is because the grandchild didn't have that earbud in and I could hear the bad language that came across that. Now, I know there are, are ways to block those things but do you think a child is going to do that? One thing, they might not know how to do that, but a parent does. If they don't, they need to ask another parent. How do I block this stuff? One thing that alarmed me, I read in an uh, epic times that I get, it was talking about how the children, during the time that there was no school going on, they had a lot of time to be on the internet. And there's a lot of things that have come about almost to epidemic proportions uh, with this transgender business that's going on. So there are lots of pits that these children can fall into that we have to protect them from. Um, I recently learned that China has introduced mandatory controls and limits on inter internet availability for the, for the children and, and for those adolescents and others. Now, do you think that's for religious purposes in China? It's so that they don't have, uh, they avoid rebellion, that's their intent, rebellion and to maintain their dictatorial control. So that's, that's their goal. But for the needs of the church, it's about developing self-control to avoid sin and promote obedience to God. Simply keeping our life pure. Uh, saving one's soul from hell. I saw a quote recently, sometimes the, the only self-control that we have mastered in our life is our generosity. Sometimes we want to control our generosity. Um, but children grow up seeking limits. All of us who have raised children have seen that, that they, they look for how far can I go with this? And mine grew up hearing, no, don't do that. No, don't do that. Some of them probably thought their name was, no, don't do that. Stop that. But... Uh, it that wasn't wasn't it, but they're looking for ways, and it doesn't stop with the small children. When they get out of toddlers, they learn to talk. We can't wait for them to walk, and then we can't wait for them to sit down. Can't wait to talk, and then we can't wait for them to be quiet. We hope when they get five years old, they go to kindergarten. A teacher's going to teach them how to be quiet. Well, we better teach them before they get there. But. They seek those limits, and we do too. We do too. But they have to learn what's right and wrong. And they may not realize it, but they depend upon parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters to help us. And I contend that we all need to be doing that vigorously. And parents, be careful not to get offended when a... a brother or sister here or a teacher or someone informs you paddles so to speak on your child for crossing the line we should be thankful for that a few weeks back i requested my young students up in that classroom 
to not bring their telephones to the Sunday school class. Oh, why would I do that? Because there were activities intermittently, which if it's intermittent, it suggests there's texting going on. Well, I, it's hard enough to teach and retain that information without that extra curricular activity. Leave that stuff with your parents. It'll be there when they get there, and then they can help you out when you sit down for worship, whether you still need it or not. Uh, so, lest they accuse me of hypocrisy, I up there you can't hear the beeper, so I had mine, and I would set my timer so I knew when class was nearly over, so that's what we did, but let's work together to protect our children and grandchildren from the wiles of Satan. We've already read the scripture. Rick, did you get that up there for me? We need to encourage each other to be good, get good, and do good. Do all the good you can to all the people you can in all the ways you can, as often as you can, and as long as you can. I really like that quote. And I think if all of us would do that, we can help one another to avoid these sins. And I have, a, I have this on the board back there for the children, and I put that on there Sunday morning, and one of the students went over and wrote amen under the, underneath it. I thought that was pretty cool. And then I added a scripture beside it, Matthew 5, 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Thank you for your time, and if there's anything that we can do to help you in your walk with, with Jesus, or if you're ready to begin that walk, we pray you'd come as we stand and sing. Gone is all my debt of sin, <coughs> a great change is brought within. And to live I now begin Risen from the fall Yet the debt I did not pay Someone died for me one day Sleeping all the dead away Jesus paid it all. Jesus died and paid it all. Yes, on the <coughs> cross of Calvary. Oh, and the stony heart was melted at his dying, dying call. Oh, his heart in shame was broken on the tree for you and me, yes, and the, <coughs> the dead is canceled, Jesus <laughs> paid it all, sinner not for me alone, did the Son of God atone your death? <coughs> he made his own on the cruel tree. Come to him with all your sins. Be as white as snow in salvation you may win and rejoice with me. Jesus died <coughs> on the cross of Calvary oh, and my stony heart was melted at his dying 
dying call. Oh, his heart in shame was broken on the tree for you and me. Yes, and the dead, the dead is canceled. Jesus paid it, paid it all. Holy Father, we approach your throne once again, thanking you for all the things that you've given us, your love for Christ. We are thankful, Father, that he was willing to leave his place with you and come to this heaven and redeem us. We're thankful for the church, and we pray that you'll bless this congregation in particular, bless our elders and deacons and Rick and our teachers, all those who are working for you. We pray that you'll bless and encourage them. Holy Father, we pray especially for Sister Connie's family, that you'll comfort and bless and, and help them during this time. We also have others who've lost recent loved ones recently and still need your prayers and for our prayers and and your help. For those who sit, we pray for, especially for our sister Vicki and for Kevin, we pray that you'll bless and help them. And there are others, there, there's others of our, of our members and our family and our friends who need your prayers. We pray for, or need your help. We pray, Father, that you'll touch them with your healing hand. And do what's best for them. We pray that you'll bless and help us the rest of this week. Pray that we will be lights to the community. Which in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. <laughs>